The next talk is uh, from uh, Ali and Jay, who were uh, very uh, early uh, engineers and data engineers uh, at Red AI, uh, explaining how they make um, AI work for radiologists. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, okay, this is working. Uh, great to see this many people, you know, this focused on listening about machine learning infrastructure. I'm actually, you know, shocked that this things, you know, uh, happened to be this way after all these years. Uh, so uh, before I start, uh, thank you for uh, our friends at Outer Bounds and Netflix for having us here. And welcome, everyone, uh, uh, here. Uh, great opportunity to talk about Red AI. Uh, before I move on, OK, so has anyone heard about Red AI so far? We've been getting a little bit more traction these days in terms of social media presence and stuff. No one? Zero? OK, two people. That's great. OK, so what, what did you hear? Like, what do you know? Like, did you look at the website? Do you, have you seen a demo? Do you know what we do at all? Or you just seen it on the, on the uh, document, you know, whatever? OK, there we go. OK, there's a guy that spoke to our director. I'm going to send you a t-shirt. Uh, you like, it's like two of you guys should get a t-shirt. Uh, anyways, uh, so my name is Ali. Uh, I'm a very early engineer at Red AI. I'm here with my colleague, Jay. Uh, he's also very early. Uh, uh, so one interesting fact about Red AI is I think, you know, even if you don't know uh, about the company, we've been using machine learning and transformers to actually write radiology reports for about uh, three years now. We've been around for more than five years, but for the last three years we had, you know, many real customers and we've been, you know, generating these uh, radiology impressions uh, since then. Uh, so uh, we, you know, the name of the practice has changed to generative AI these days. It's it's a brand new name. I catched up a little late, actually. By I think someone from the business team catched me up that we call it the generative AI now. So we've been doing this for a while. I think we're in a pretty good position to uh, talk about our experience with Metaflow, uh, for sure. Uh, it's been very instrumental for us to scale out the engineering organization. Uh, to move our company from research phase to an actual engineering phase, I would say, where there's a lot of growth, where where focus is not a, about like you know building models with better accuracy. It's more like, hey, let's build these models all day, every day, and ship a new one. You know, how fast we can do it. You know, every month, every day, whatever is most doable. Uh, so during that step, we got introduced to Metaflow, and on my side, uh, so I've been around for around almost five years now, so I've seen, I worked in different areas. I worked in core services, the data infrastructure, data plumbing. Currently, I work on machine learning operations and infrastructure or AI ops or, you know, that sort of gray area where you don't do research, but you're supposed to be, you know, running these models or helping researchers to build these models and integrate them. So that's what I do. And I've seen, like, many, many batch processing tools. I've been demoed many times. I researched a bunch of them uh, to find the one that fits our needs. I think specifically for our business, we rarely have these conventional you know, transformation tasks. Like I remember someone just like a couple of years ago asked me, hey, why don't you just use Spark? I'm like, oh, come on. So all of like most of our tasks are very much data science. So, you know, but you know, your analytics might be about getting an average across a batch of records. Ours is getting a summarization or getting a classification. So I think Metaflow has helped a lot with that problem. Uh, and I think right now, like our talk is less technical than the previous ones. It's more about maybe like a, it builds up on, on the first presentation about our practical experience using Metaflow. Uh, but we'll be here for, uh, for questions after this. And I'm going to leave it to Jay to carry out the presentation as that timer is running out on me. There you are. Hi, everyone. My name's Jay. I'm a machine learning engineer at Rad AI, and I started off as a data engineer. So this is going to be the agenda of the talk. Ali already gave an introduction. I'll probably show you what a radiology report actually looks like, because I don't think everyone has seen a radiology report. Uh, then we'll mostly talk about like two products. Omni impressions and continuity, and then we'll talk about the pre and post uh, Metaflow stages of these products. So just for a quick background, uh, Rad AI was started in 2018 with the objective of using AI to save time and reduce burnout for radiologists and also obviously improve patient care. 
uh and this is a uh, very simple and maybe wrong because i just wrote that <laughs> uh, radiology report so these the the top box you see clinical data which is like why did the patient come for an examination like what were the symptoms because of which the patient had to go to a doctor then exam is the exam that was performed the radiology exam like this is a x-ray chest of uh, x-ray of a chest from two different views and comparison is like if a patient had already been to an hospital or radiologist before they can like compare the current stat status of the patient with the previous status or previous state of the patient and findings is one of the most important sections of the report this is when the radiologist is observing the images and they are just stating everything they see in the image it can be positive negative neutral they just uh, say everything and finally the product that we do is using all of the four uh, fields in the top box to automatically generate an impression. That's where generative AI and LLMs come into play for ad AI. And impression is just an abstractive summarization of findings, but we also use information in the other fields, and we generate this automatically and saving time for the radiologists. One other thing that I want <coughs> you guys to focus on is the recommendation. This is something that we use for our product continuity where like we automatically identify these recommendations in the report and make sure that the patient comes back and follows up on that recommendation because sometimes it just gets lost in communication so yeah uh, our two products are that we'll be talking about today's uh, radii omni impressions and radii continuity o omni impressions is the product that automatically generates impressions using the findings and other sections of the report we have now almost around like half a billion reports in our training data set. And for continuity, like I said, this is an automated follow-up management tool where we use AI to automatically detect recommendations and making sure the patient closes on the loop. So Omni Impressions is actually the most more complex uh, ML architecture in our company. And it has like several stages before eventually we have a model that goes into production. The first one is data pre-processing, then feature generation, model training, and finally model evaluation. So the thing is like each of these stages had like several sub steps that need to be done in an order. And this would all the time require like a lot of handshakes between engineers. One engineer will do a one step and then wait for the next one to carry out the next step, which just increase the time for <laughs> data pre-processing or any of these steps. And because we work with like such huge data, we always had to like spin up multiple machines, run processes on those machines and then combine results. The, the development and deployment was used to be done on like different machines. And obviously there was no version control. I was just naming my folders with the date of that day. <laughs> and there was always, dif always difficulty reproducing experiments. And all of the entire process always needed some engineer overlooking the process. So this wasn't just fun and a lot and really time consuming. So post Metaflow, we just converted every stage of the pipeline into its own Metaflow pipeline. Like now we have a pipeline for data pre-processing, feature generation, model training, and evaluation. And like Ali was also saying in his introduction, earlier data pre-processing alone took like two, three days. And we used to do it in like maybe in every three or four months. But now because of Metaflow, we can do this every day. Like we, uh, we have a cron job which just runs and we are able to do our data collection right from production. So yeah, why Metaflow? So like I said, every step, sub step for every stage automatically converted into a Metaflow pipeline. Uh, Metaflow allowed us to run like everything on its own isolated environment in the pipeline and in terms of like running several machines and combining the results, there's just like built-in support in Metaflow to do that. You don't have to worry about anything. Metaflow also allows for like auto scaling and version control. And because of all of, all of these things, we just have like reduced engineer overhead in the entire process. And the best thing about Metaflow is like all of this is just Python centric. You don't need to go <clears throat> and learn anything new to learn Metaflow. Like, like Spark. <laughs> yeah, in terms of impact, the pre-processing time has 
gone down from two to three days to just one day. The feature generation, earlier we used to require like two or three engineers to finish that task. Now it can be done by just like one engineer. The model training, it's just like an automated pipeline with out of the box uh, version control and improved visibility into the stage in which we are in the model training. And for model evaluation, we had to like do a lot of infrastructure management, which is just taken care by Metaflow now. So this is, this is our tech stack for the different steps involved. And all of them is happening in Metaflow pipelines. So, yeah. Now, moving on to like continuity uh, metric generation pipeline. So this, this, this is a very simple pipeline compared to uh, Omni Impressions. This is just one pipeline doing one task, which is like given reports from a radiology practice. We hit uh, those reports to a machine learning model. We accumulate results and share those results with our customers. But before Metaflow, because the volume of data was so big, we had to like spin up multiple AWS instances. On those instances, we had to like spin up multiple Docker containers, finally combine those results, then generate one metric and then generate another metric, which obviously, as you all can see, can be really time consuming. And also like error prone, because when you are operating on so many machines and then combining results, you there are many possibilities where you can go wrong and introduce an error. But with Metaflow, it just like automatically converted in itself into a DAG where we can like load data, pre-process data, and hit the machine learning model in parallel. And again, I don't have to like go and spin up these AWS machines. Uh, Metaflow just does this out of the box and combines the results. I don't have to worry about anything. It also allows us for like parallel computation for the different metrics, and we save the results to S3, and that's it. So pre-Metaflow, <laughs> engineer was annoyed and frustrated because that was me. I was, I was doing that pipeline manually, and now I'm happy. I have a smile on my face. Uh, <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, and also just because like I had to like do so many things, it just ended up taking like one to two days because something sometimes something would go wrong or we would some find something's wrong with the data after like multiple steps in the pipeline. But now it just gets done in three to four hours depending on the size of the data. I just have to click a button and I get the results. Also, because I was spinning up those machines and sometimes I would go to sleep without turning off the machine. So we always ended up paying a lot more than we should have. It, the cost has obviously gone down from like, oh, these are like rough estimates, but say like $600 to like $80, which is a big impact. And yeah, there's like, for me, I don't have to worry about the infrastructure at all. It's just Metaflow who does that. And yeah, earlier I was like involved in every step of the pipeline, and now I just go and check the results. So there is like no to low engineer involvement. Yep. That was us. Any any questions? Uh, Ali actually wants to add one thing. Yeah, I think one small thing we haven't covered is here. We use Metaflow both through like a sort of a local instance to still manage a cluster. We also did the full deployment on AWS Batch, which is pretty cool. Uh, really like that. Uh, like you know, uh, one of the most sort of I think complex and well-functioning uh, tools we had, uh, we have in our system still uh, holding up really well. Uh, anyways, any questions? Hi there, uh, my name is Irving. I'm an ML platform engineer. Uh, I've seen auto scaling mentioned for Metaflow a couple of times. Could you just describe your experience uh, with it and sort of how you configure it as someone who has not used Metaflow before? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the AWS batch deployment specifically. I'm trying to remember. It's been a year I set it up. Uh, I mean, so Metaflow, as I recall, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it's it manages AWS batch, uh, which under the hood manages uh, AWS ECS, which under the hood plugs into AWS EC2. Uh, so essentially, Metaflow would make requests to AWS batch then it would make requests to underlying compute layer to get those instances. Uh, 
part of this is actually, I, as I recall correctly, when I use like from our Metaflow pipelines, is part of this control is at the application layer when you write Metaflow flows. You specify, you know, you want to write on batch. Uh, I recall you can specify whether you want a GPU unit. Uh, I'm not sure if you can specify the cluster size there, but I'm sure you can map every single batch in your data set if you're doing batch sort of processing in small batches to be mapped onto a particular compute resource, whether it's an instance or, or, or like, you know, maybe a container. Uh, so that's my experience. Do you want to add something, Jay? Roughly, uh, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Hopefully that helped. Hey, um, I'm Amin. I'm a machine learning engineer, and uh, my question is more a meta question. Um, so there's a saying from Jeffrey Hinton in 2016 that people should stop training for radiolo radiologists now. You probably know that uh, because in five years they are going to go out of business. So do you think we are on the way to get there or are we going to eventually just augment their work <laughs> rather than replace This is them? funny. You know, I have a friend who didn't choose radiology uh, because of this fact, but I don't think so. I think what is happening is pretty much similar to every field. If you can use these AI technologies as tools to conduct your business or your work, you are going to be well off. But yeah, if somehow you fall behind and all these new new technologies are foreign to you, it's going to be hard to justify unless you're somehow super productive and keep up with these you know, compute clusters. Uh, but that's how I see it. Uh, like by observing our own work, I still didn't see any evidence of like, you know, not requiring doctors at all. You know, they are, for example, for our product, what we, I mean, even if we write this, uh, generate this text, it's it's technically a template until a doctor signs off on it, right? Uh, so I'll be surprised. You know, we'll never know, I guess. it Things will get a lot faster, I think. You know, maybe there will be less work to do for doctors, more oriented towards judgment calls, uh, rather than maybe tedious, repetitive work. But I'll be very surprised if these doctors become relevant uh, in the field, uh, hopefully. Are you a doctor now? You're a mission engineer, so you don't care, okay. <laughs> hopefully that helped. Hi, uh, my name is Nick, I'm a machine learning engineer. Uh, this product looks super cool, um, but one question, uh, how, do you, how do you mitigate risk in the generative AI space when you're working with uh, protected health information? So like, you're training on uh, patient records and then you're doing summarization mm -hmm. on other records. So how, how do you kind of like manage that risk of actually leaking Very information uh, across, across models? So, let me think of an analogy here. You know, when you when you think about security, like if you th talk to your best security person, he's always like layers on top of layers. You know, you, you have security there, security, you're like, it's, you kind of have an overall sense of resilience by having many layers of security. Even if one layer just breaks down, the second is there and it's solid. Uh, I think it's very similar on our side. We make a sort of an eager effort to remove PHI when we extract data. From there, once we get data, it's isolated in a very, very specific way with a very limited access. Even then, once a consumer read, something reads that data, it's de-identified de again. And also in our online inference systems, this the same approach is still there. So technically, our Hopefully, we don't even see patient data. That's the goal. But it's very possible that, you know, given these legacy systems, there might be some misses. And in some, like, sort of abrupt spot on a report, you know, this, these all, like, all these different practices across the country that happens. So it's, we still need to be ready for it. Uh, but we, the way we go about it is we have many layers of the identification. And I, luckily, right now, uh, we are fine uh, spitting out the patient information. Uh, we can do it still. Uh, but it's definitely, whenever you work in healthcare, that's kind of the number one uh, concern. And it's a very strict law with a lot of, it's hard to tell what it's asking for too. But, you know, we got to be on it. You got to get a lot of legal advice. And it's kind of an engineering thing you build up over time, I would say, uh, once you deal with healthcare records. Hopefully that was helpful. Thank you. Um, we'll cut the questions here for now uh, to leave the other speakers time. Thank you so much for your talk. And if you have more questions, please find them at the happy hour. Thank you. <laughs>